All right, so something I realized when uh, Vince was speaking was, I don't know if we did this on purpose, but the, the way we've designed the day today is there's kind of a funnel. Um, it, start, it started with kind of you know, higher level vision purpose of SBI. Vince's comments took us a click deeper into you know, years of experiences and lessons learned. Um, what I'm gonna take us to next is uh, kind of a next step down into that funnel into at a cross industry level empirically what we're seeing out in the world uh, in terms of what's working and what's not. One of the things that I like most and value most about, about working and being part of SBI, and I should say this carefully because my CEO, well, he's not in the room right now, but I got lots of colleagues in the room as well, so I love everything, everything about SBI. <laughs> it's great. Uh, but there's one, one thing that I think is uh, differentiating, really special uh, about the firm and how we approach things is we're focused on what works, right? Like that, that's what we're driven by. Um, and you see it in the way that we engage with you all as clients, um, where the work we do is very contextual, right? It's very um, focused on what's going on in your organizations and how is it that we can apply our methodologies and our experiences to improve the situation. It's also reflected in the fact that they've invested in in a research department, right? They have me here, we have a team, um, and we're, we're specifically um, here and doing our work to find what works, right? To look out there in the world and see what, where are people being successful, how and why, and what is it about that that we can translate and transfer uh, to you all, to our clients, and, and then ultimately to the work that we do um, on behalf of and in support of all of you. So, what I'm going to share with you here is an example of that. Um, it's what we've done across the past 12, 15 months um, in two separate research initiatives that um, somewhat accidentally but, but very happily um, linked up uh, together and, and, and uh, formed a, a broader story that we're going to share with you here today. Um, I'm going to start with where we started and why we started. The problem that we were observing. So we started hearing this, I don't know, towards the end of 2022, and then it, it just hasn't stopped. Um, the, the, uh, the messaging, the, the conversations that we've been having with CEOs, with CROs, with just all of our clients, this idea that um, the commercial productivity is stagnant. Right? That's the first chart that you see there. Um, this number here, 62%, it's like um, unbelievably consistent. We, we, we ask CEOs about this every year. Rate the, rate the or sorry, every quarter. Rate the, how would you characterize seller productivity in your organization? It's like almost six, always, always 62% um, or in the 60s in terms of the percentage who are telling us that it's flat to declining. It's kind of like, and, and the story behind it has always been a version of um, our pipelines are great. We just can't get, we can't get buyers to progress through those pipelines. Um, and um, you see it reflected in the middle there on our revenue returns, right? Like this is, um, Vince shared um, this chart as well. Our efficiency is, er is eroding as a result of this, right? Our, our investments are offering us less return. Um, and then when we ask CEOs about this, what is driving it, right? And we asked them very specifically, we said, is it your sellers? Is it your product, is it the offering, or is it the buyers? And you see there, 56% of them tell us that um, rank the buyer as the first, the most important factor driving this, uh, this uh, stagnation in commercial productivity and commercial output. Um, and then when we ask them to penny it, it's always the most pennies end up um, on the buyer. And so we kind of smirked at this, right? It's like, of course. Right? Of course they're gonna say it's the buyer. It's the other guy, right? It's not me, it's not our product, it's not our sellers. It's the buyer, right? There's something wrong with the buyer. Um, and so we went out to ask buyers about this, right? Because in a way we were skeptical. And it turns out that, the, that they're right, right? Like it's a huge factor, but they're only partly right. They're like two thirds right, um, is what we're, what we're showing you here. So when we ask buyers what's going on, right? In their interactions with suppliers, when they're trying to make purchases, new purchases, repurchases, whatever it might be, 
they tell us about three sources of friction that are that they're facing um, in their commercial decision making. The first one is our fault. The first one is supplier fault. Supplier created friction. And in particular, what they tell us is, um, uh, on average, when they're speaking with an individual supplier organization, they're talking to at least five different people as part of their commercial decision making with that organization. Um, but what they tell us as well is 70% of them tell us they don't even know what they all do. Right? It's just like five different people from within the organization. Maybe that's a good thing, maybe that's a bad thing, but it's, it creates confusion um, for the buyers in terms of who do I go to for what? How do I get my questions answered? And they tell us that the experience they have with their vendors is just frustrating in general. They also talk about the, the, overarching, the, the overall complexity of the offerings that people are putting in front of them um, as, a, as another factor. So we're curating part of the problem with the buyers. But then the other two thirds of it is all about them and what's going on in their organizations. And there are lots of things that we've heard about before, um, but to see them all together, it gets kind of striking, right? So if we just talk about the middle part, buyer created friction, 12 decision makers. You've seen all different numbers of this, but it's usually in the double digits in terms of the number of people involved in making a decision about a purchase. What's interesting to us about this is that when you ask them a, a, a little bit more detail, half of those people are ad hoc, what they call ad hoc members. That means that we probably don't know about them. We don't know who they are. We don't know when they get involved. Um, we don't know what level of influence they have on the decision. Guess what? Almost all of those ad hoc members have veto power over the decision. Um, so there are a dozen people, half of them we don't even know who they are. Um, and they're, they're um, creating friction um, for the people who are trying to make a decision on what to buy. Um, lots of internal bureaucracy, lots of executive oversight, CEOs getting involved in deals way smaller than they ever would have before, and these types of things don't feel like they're going away. And then finally, the third third of this on the environment. So there's, of course, the macro environment. That's a problem for them. That's troubling for them. That makes it difficult for them to make a decision because they're just not sure where the market's going to be next quarter, next year, et cetera. Um, but then see that thing on the top, seven change events. This is within their organizations. This is from the minute, from the first time they talked with a supplier to the time that they made a decision and signed the contract, seven things have happened on average within their organizations that have changed the nature of what's going on. It's a different company by the time that they're, um, that, that they're made a decision than when you started talking with them. These changes are things like you know, new org design, new product offering, uh, new, uh, new roles introduced into the, into the um, decision making process. All kinds of things happening that just make it kind of confusing for them about where they need to go and where it is they're going. And so they just see in the, the, the decision making progress this idea of greater risk. And what's interesting about this is it's not necessarily that they're, that they're afraid they're messing up, right? They're not necessarily afraid that they're making a decision that's irreversible. They're kind of in fear of overcommitting because of that number of change events that's happening and because of the oversight that they're getting within their organization and because of the amount of change that's happening, they just think about this and say, well, I think I need it now. Am I going to need it later? Um, and is it going to be the right solution for me later? So all three of these things, now they would be, they would be bad enough if they're in isolation. They're all happening at the same time. Remember that, right? We're doing things. We're putting too many people in front of them. They're experiencing all of these change events. They're getting um, new people coming into the decision-making pro process all the time. And so it's kind of no wonder, right, that our pipelines are really strong. Like they come in with some enthusiasm, and then they get kind of worn down by the process. It's killing deals. So if you look at an environment that has... Um, high friction, and you compare that with an environment that has low friction for a buyer. It's hard to find the ones that have low friction, but when you look at the difference, there's a 43% reduction in the odds of a uh, purchase happening. So basically, if you're, if you're forecasting that as like a 80% you know, probability that it's going to come in, maybe it's closer to 60, 55. Um, so this friction is, you know, I probably didn't need to put a chart and put math up there to tell you 
that buyer friction is killing deals. But if somebody in your organization is saying, um, you know, why aren't you closing deals faster? You got a little bit of evidence here. Here's why. Here's what's happening, right? Just theoretically, but but just like conceptually, how it happens. When they start the, uh, sorry, there's like weird weirdness happening with the uh, with the hard returns. It's like messing with my brain. So um, anyway, when they start the process, they have this high commitment to change, right? They don't start talking to you because like they're curious, right? Like they start talking to you because they've got a change. They've got something that they're trying to to do to enact. Um, and they want to do it. As they go through this process, right, talking with you, um, going through their consideration set, um, these, these changes that we're talking about happen, right? And they happen repeatedly. And it wears them down, right? Over time, it wears them down. And where they fall, um, oftentimes, is in a worst case scenario, the zone of no decision, right? They just say, you know what? There's too much going on right now. I just don't know what's, I just don't know what's happening. I don't know where we're going to be. We're just going to pause. We're going to hold on this. Or maybe even worse for a lot of us, they end up in this middle zone, the zone of a good enough decision. They had high ambitions about what they were going to do, but they end up somewhere in the middle where they're like, yeah, okay, I'll buy this, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to go with all of these features and you know, I'm going to roll it out slowly and we're going to, let's just see what happens. A good enough decision. Where we want them to be is up at the top, right? What we'd call a bold decision. And our research finds that it's possible. So 31% of the decisions that we found in our data set um, were what we would call bold decisions. And there's a very specific measure of what a bold decision is. It's a decision where the buyer spends 15% more than they thought they would going in. So I thought I was going to spend a million bucks. I'm spending, I gave myself a hard one, 1.15 million bucks. Um, but they are 62% more likely to be an advocate for your organization. So an increase in demonstrated advocacy. So they're spending more money than they wanted to with you, and they're happy about it, and they will tell their friends to spend that same amount of money with you. Bold decisions, bold purchase decisions. Now, we didn't evaluate this um, in, our, in our surveying, but I, uh, I've, I've done some informal analysis since then, and 100% of... Um, CEOs, CROs, enablement leaders, revenue professionals want to see more bold purchase decisions. I can't validate that, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's true. So that's the question that we went out to research and, and, and find an answer to. How do we reverse declining commercial productivity? Right, all of the things that we're seeing about the, the number of dollars that we're getting for every dollar that we um, spend on sales and marketing how do we reverse that decline? And how do we get bigger, bolder purchase decisions? How do we get people into that green zone um, at the top? So we did some things that we think are pretty unique um, to investigate this. We looked at this from two different angles. And I'm going to talk about them a little bit separately, um, but, uh, but, they, but they fit together really well. So the first part of this is we looked at buying teams. We interviewed buying teams. Some of the data I've been showing you already is from that research with buying teams. And, and so we, we asked individuals 643 purchase decisions, right? So, um, and these purchase decisions um, were not just a new purchase. So we looked across the spectrum of purchase types. New purchases, um, uh, uh, switches um, to a different supplier, uh, renewals, uh, and expansion. So we looked at all of them. Not just sales, or initial sales. Um, and we looked at the entire go-to-market experience that they had. So not just their experience with the seller, but their experience with the marketing materials, their experience with, um, uh, with any channel partners that they might have had, et cetera. Right? We looked at all of the different go-to-market touch points that they've had. And then we did fancy math, right? cluster analysis, regression analysis, to see what's working and what's not statistically. Um, so that was the first uh, part of it. The second part of it was with commercial teams. So we looked at now 800 plus, and we've got assessments that, that allow us to continue to collect data on this front. Uh, but 800 plus 
commercial team members. With this inventory that we have of skills and competencies that we've developed at SBI over decades of uh, doing top grading exercises on behalf of our clients. Um, and again, there we did fancy math to understand what is driving the most successful um, uh, go-to-market professionals in terms of their, uh, their outputs. Now, what's really important to know about this is this data is pretty contemporary, right? It's, it's from the past um, year. You know, I'm just thinking about when the first survey went out was almost exactly a year ago. So the data is from about the past year. Um, and so it's very reflective of what's happening in today's market. Um, and that's important given everything that we've heard this morning in terms of change and all the things that are happening out in the world um, these days in terms of the market. Um, and so I'm going to first tell you what we learned from buying teams in terms of what is driving them to make these bold purchase decisions, what it kind of, a, a, of, of a, a interactions they're having. And then we'll talk about what we're learning from commercial teams. So the first, the first part of the buying teams reaffirm something that we've known for like 13 years. Um, so my colleague Nick Toman um, and, uh, and, and others were part of um, research that you're probably all familiar with called the Challenger Sale. Um, and one thing that they identified um, early on and we've looked at again and, and seems to be the same is when you think about the, the interaction that a buyer has with your organization, there are kind of two aspects to it. There's the offering, which is what you have, right? What, what do you got? What are you giving me in terms of the product, the uh, pricing it is, the brand reputation that you bring um, to them? That's one, right? And then you've got the go-to-market experience. It's how they feel um, as they're interacting with you as a supplier, as a potential supplier, or as a, as a current supplier, and they're thinking about re-engaging with you and continuing their engagement with you. 13 years ago, we understood that the offering um, or sorry, that the experience matter a lot more than the offering. And guess what, it still does. 59% right? of the decision um, is impacted by the experience. 41% is impacted by the offering. The offering matters, it always does. It's kind of table stakes. So 13 years ago, we knew this. Um, if the green check mark, check mark weren't there, it would, you would see the number 58. So we're doing good. About 60% of us, um, in terms of when we ask suppliers, how, how, or sorry, ask buyers, how is the supplier doing in terms of the offering? Is it doing what, what you needed to do in order to make a bold purchase decision? 60% of them say, yeah, check, it's good. So that probably means that 40% of the people in this room have a little bit of work to do on the offering. 24%, only 24% tell us that the experience is meeting the bar that they need in order to make a bold purchase decision. So three quarters of this room has work to do on the experience. So if you have work to do on the offering, please do it. Um, if you have, a lot of you have work to do on the experience. Um, and the thing that, the thing that kind of um, puzzled us about this is, as I mentioned, what I say 13 years ago, right, that, that this idea was first uncovered. And I guarantee, I'm positive, that everybody in this room thinks about the experience that you're um, providing to your prospects and to your customers and how that might impact their purchases. And you're trying to make improvements um, to that. So it's not new and it's not something you're not working on. I didn't tell you something you probably didn't already know. But so why, right? Why do only 24% of us, or why only 24% of the time does the buyer tell us that the experience is there? And we think that what's happening is that the need of the experience is changing. So let me show you what I mean by this. I'm gonna get like kind of a little historical, a little theoretical here um, for a second. But just think about the history of, of selling and the history of like go-to-market experiences that we've had um, across the past couple of decades. Um, we started a while back with solution selling, right? With this idea of, okay, we can't just say like, Here's our catalog, you wanna buy it, right? Like, what do you want? Um, we had to package solutions in a way that really matched to the problems that the customers were, um, were articulating to us. Like, that was a really important breakthrough that we had in terms of what kind of an experience we're providing to the customer, because it was like one of the first times that we actually started to um, 
uh, proactively provide an experience as opposed to just like not a, just a nice catalog or whatever it might have been. So solution selling was there. What happens though over time? It becomes a little less differentiated, right? Your product, your solution, it, um, it starts to commoditize a little bit because everybody does it. Um, and so where we went to next, the realization was insight selling. Why customers buy was just as important. This idea that we needed to teach them a new way to address their problems. So it wasn't just about they bring us a problem. At times, a lot of times for us, it's about let us help them to understand the magnitude of the problem that they're facing um, and the ways in which they're not completely understanding that problem so that we can help them to understand how our solutions matter. Really important addition to the go-to-market experience. Everybody has thought leadership now. Right? Everybody has it. We all talk about, we all have this architecture that we can offer to our clients. So again, it becomes a little bit less differentiated. Next, we went to this idea of value selling. And, and you, know, you can quibble with which came first, insight or value, or, or, or um, value, value than insight. Um, the idea of, of value selling, of course, is we quantify the value of solving that problem. It's the ROI calculators. What happens there is the ROI calculators start to face reality a little bit, right? And so people maybe get a little bit less confident in that ROI calculation that they're giving them because they know you're inflating the numbers a little bit um, and you're just trying to make a really strong case. Um, and, so, and similarly, we all can now articulate the value that might be delivered. So we lose differentiation. This is not, by the way, I'm not saying that we need to stop doing these. Notice that the arrow, the, the, the uh, very precise arrow goes up, right? It's that over time, they become table stakes. They become what's needed, what's necessary, what everybody is doing and what everybody expects. But there's something else that's going to differentiate that experience. And so what we believe is that part of the reason why only 24% of us uh, or only 24% of the time does a buyer say that we're doing the things that help us to to um, make bold purchase decisions is because we're doing all of this, but we're missing something in terms of what it is that they're looking for. So that's what we, our, our research is trying to find. And we found something that we think is pretty interesting. So it's three things um, that make up um, the experience that, uh, that customers are looking for today. So let me just tell you about the numbers here before I get into the details of what's in here. So basically what you're seeing is that number, 137%. So that, that, is the, um, that is the percentage increase in likelihood that somebody is going to make a bold purchase decision if you deliver this well. Um, so for each of these, you see a, a pretty significant increase, right? You're going to more than double it. You're going to almost double it for, for the third one. So three things that you see here. First, advance the customer evolution, anticipate customer roadblocks, align the team to the customer direction. They all start with A. We thought about calling this like AAA selling, but we, uh, we convinced ourselves not to. Um, but let me tell you what we mean by each of those, because they're kind of words without, they're kind of concepts without meaning right now. Advanced customer evolution. You heard Vince actually use these words in a slightly different context, just talking about, um, about people within the organization. But what suppliers or what buyers are telling us is we need somebody who gets it, who understands where we as an organization are going, what direction we're heading in. Um, and we need someone who demonstrates that they, that they get it, get where we're going, and can adapt to where we're going as our needs change. So that's the first one. They feel like an extension of our team. The second one, anticipating the customer roadblocks. When we are out there and looking around the corners for our, our buyers, um, telling them what it is they can expect, telling them what we've seen out in the market and how that might reflect on their organizations. We deliver insights and we guide them around the roadblocks that they might not even see. Maybe with, it's within their internal buying process or it's within the journeys that they're trying to um, uh, advance along within their organizations. Matters a lot. Makes it a lot easier for them. And then finally, aligning the team to the customer direction. Remember what I told you, five different people who are talking to them. One thing that they told us that I didn't put on the slide is um, 
it was some, somewhere again in the 70% of, of buyers said, I find myself repeating myself more often than I would like to with these individuals, right? And that's just reflective of the complexity that we've often introduced into our go-to-market organizations that we then thrust upon our, our buyers and our customers in hopes of actually of, of delivering a better experience, but in a lot of cases, it just mucks things up for them. Um, and so when you see a go-to-market team that moves in the same direction, when they have confidence in every individual who they're talking with, and when there's consistency across all of those touch points, they are much more likely to make a bold purchase decision. Now, if you align this, right, if you think, think about this in relation to what I was telling you about what's going on um, with the buyers, um, the amount of change that they're experiencing, the amount of complexity that they're experiencing within their organizations. This makes a lot of sense, right? Because we are, it's all about helping them to navigate that change and feel confident that we're going to be able to um, work with them and partner with them no matter what it is that's coming at them. So we call these things together headway selling. It's the idea of we're, we're building trust, we're demonstrating can help customers succeed as their needs and goals evolve and that everyone in the organization is aligned around that evolution. So headway selling is about helping the, the customer to make headway along the journey that they're, um, they themselves are taking. Um, and interestingly and importantly, sometimes the customer doesn't know exactly what that journey is, uh, but what they want to feel and what they need to feel from a supplier as they're interacting with them is that that's okay and that that supplier is gonna be with them no matter what that looks like. And I'm going to put this into numbers for, for a second, into deeper numbers. So in terms of the likelihood that you're going to see more bold decision, purchase decisions, when you take all of those three, three things together, and when you're good at all three of those things, remember I told you we looked at three different types of purchases. We looked at net new, we looked at renewals, we looked at expansion. And the impact is like amazing for all of them, right? So almost 300% more likely to make a bold purchase decision um, on a net new purchase when you're doing those three things that we talked about. Um, similarly, like more than, more than uh, three times as likely on renewal and twice as likely on expansion, right? You double your chances that that expansion decision is going to be, again, 15% more than what they told you they were going to do, um, but they're happy to do it and they're increasing in their demonstrated advocacy for you. And just to add on to it, what we also see is a 33, we're very precise, 33.5, not 0.4, not 0.6, 33.5% increase in average win rate um, within, for any individual um, seller. I think we'd all feel pretty good about that, right? Like if we could see that, right? If we could see more bold decisions happening, um, see increases in our win rates, see you know, a doubling in the, the, the percentage of people who are going to make um, really big expansion decisions with us. Something I should add here, um, just to like be a nerd for a second, you see this subtitle here, finding statistically significant at a 98% confidence level. That's really good, right? Like, it makes us feel really good and confident about what we're saying. It basically means that if we were to run this analysis 100 times, 98 times out of 100, you would see the same result. So the numbers may not be exactly you know, 226, but if, if we talked with you know, 600 additional buyers and looked at 600 additional buying decisions, it would be um, similar uh, direction in terms of what we're seeing here. So we feel really, this is really robust. So as we think about like what's going on here, you know, we talked about how the, um, the, the go-to-market experience is evolving and we're kind of that next stage of how the go-to-market experience needs to evolve. When you think about like, why is somebody, why is somebody making a purchase? Right? What are they buying? They're not buying your product. Right? They're buying a solution to a problem. They're buying change. They're launching an initiative, some kind of initiative, that probably impacts their career in some way. Um, and certainly impacts or should be impacting the direction of their organization in some way. And they come to you because 
they see you as a, as a possible uh, and hopeful partner in going along in terms of like helping them to achieve that outcome that they're trying to achieve. And what happens when we talk about our solution and how it solves their problem, or we introduce a, we introduce a problem and we help them to understand the magnitude of it, um, or we go into value selling and tell them the amount of return that they can see, it's all focused on the problem that they're facing now, right? the problem that they brought to you. It's the here and now that's happening um, when, we, when we take those, those classic approaches. What headway selling is doing is, um, is coming through that here and now and going further, right? Going to showing them that you can adapt to the change, showing them that you can evolve um, as their needs evolve, um, and then ensuring with them long-term success, what's sustainable. Put your hand up. Oh, no, okay, stretching. So headway selling is, is us being there for them across the entire journey and beyond um, where they're trying to go as they implement that change and as they think about what's going to come next and what's going to come next and what's going to come next and is this supplier going to be there for me when I do this. And when you think about like, you could imagine that this is um, really important in complex sales, right? Like big ticket items, really important. We look at our data, um, we, we looked at the size of the deals. Basically, what we, what we can tell you for sure is if the deal that you're trying to sell is under $25,000, it's probably more important to focus on the product. When you get into that 25 to 50 range, we can't statistically tell you, right? Like it's, it's kind of a blend. When you're over 50,000 in terms of, the, in terms of the, the size of the deal you're trying to sell, um, headway selling is what matters. It's what's going to get you that deal, and it's what's going to get you that bold purchase decision. Um, so um, if you're smaller than 25000 and importantly, the, the organization that you're working with is not experiencing a lot of change in complexity, good on the product. Talk it up. Um, but if they're like any organization that we all deal with and that we all live in, they're experiencing more than one change event, and they're making a, a bigger purchase, um, headway selling is what matters. All right, how are we doing on time? We're good. Let me pause there. Anybody feel, how, how are you all feeling this in terms of what's going on in your in your day to day and your interactions with suppliers, with customers? Anyone have um, stories that, that sound like this or things that you've done that have may, maybe been counter to this? Anything to share? Yes, please. I actually have, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so what I'm gonna go back. for organizational design? Because I feel like part of the problem is organizations are working the way that they're designed to work. Uh. And if you don't have an organization that de is designed to deliver on that experience, yeah. that can become the problem even when there's a team of talent that's capable of doing this. If you don't have the, the go-to-market set off to mm -hmm. deliver here, yeah, yeah. Did everyone hear the the comment? Yeah, good. Um, so, in terms of what it means for design, I, I think you're you're keying onto the important thing, right? It's this last one, aligning the entire team to the to the uh, customer's direction. I think it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to like rethink your departments and you know stop with customer success um, and go to only a farmer model, for example, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that. What it means from a, it, it may not mean anything from a design perspective, because there are lots of reasons why you design the way you design, but what it means is the communication, the accountabilities that you set across um, those different parts of the organization, um, maybe even the technologies that you have in place so that you're sharing information, um, that all of that is tight, um, so, that the, the, so that when we're interacting with the, uh, with the, the buying organization, Again, it feels like we're all moving in the same direction. So whatever that takes, it could take a design um, uh, intervention if we're not able to do this through incentives, through communication, through technology um, implementations that we would have. Um, if we're able to do it through those other mechanisms and there are good reasons why you would have more complexity when you're in your go-to-market organization, Awesome, go for it. So I wouldn't necessarily think about it as, a, as initially a design thing, except for as like a role design, 
and an accountabilities and a, and a um, process design thing first. Good one. Yeah. Whenever you hear about um, kind of new framework, it's kind of intimidating. It's, yeah. Oh, God, how much work am I going to need to do to transform my organization to do this and not what I was doing before? But I bet that we're already doing a lot of this already. Could you mm -hmm. give maybe some tangible examples of in each of those categories of things that we're probably doing that we just need to do better and do more of? Yeah. Um, so it was probably hard on that side to hear. Um, so the the uh, question slash comment was, we're probably doing a lot of this already. And the question was, what are some tangible examples of each of them so that we can kind of get a sense and a flavor for um, what it looks like and, and maybe do a little self-diagnosis of to what degree we're, um, we're doing this. Um, fair? You get it? Um, and, and when I get into the buyer, or sorry, into the, to the um, commercial team part of this, we'll get in a little bit more detail on it, but just to give you a little sense of it. So advance the customer evolution. Um, examples here would be um, about having a conversation about um, uh, where you're trying to go, right? Like what, what does the next um, two years, three years, five years of your journey as an organization look like? And what do you anticipate that your needs are gonna be? No doubt that that's gonna be wrong, whatever they assess. Um, but it's, that it's, it's giving them that, that understanding of what that might look like. Um, another aspect of advance the customer evolution that would be important is as you're making a business case, you're using the client's and the customer's own data as part of that. And not just like what you can find, but you've spent time with them and you've dug into their metrics, to their performance, um, to their data, to understand um, what's going on in their organization and be able to model things out for them um, into the future. So that's a, that's a version of that. Um, in terms of anticipating customer roadblocks, the most tangible thing um, that you can do here is to be um, very clear initially within your organization about what the buying journey looks like, kind of like on average, right, for your buyers. So you should have a well-articulated buying journey already. Um, and then your sellers and your, um, let's just say your sellers, right, your team is going to be focused on how does that buying journey um, look um, compared with the individual and group that I'm working with right now, right? And so it's getting deep into the understanding of what the customer's buying journey is um, and that specific customer's buying journey is. Uh, because, and in a lot of cases, the customer doesn't know, right? They don't know what their buying journey is, so. Part of it is helping them along in terms of developing and understanding what their buying journey is going to be. And proactively, by the way, not step by step, not like what's your next step, but like what are your next three steps um, looking like. Um, aligning the team to the customer direction. Um, some of the things that I was just talking about. Having good shared accountability or at least clear accountability for who's accountable for what number? Who's accountable for the renewal number? Who's accountable for the expansion number? Is it the same person? If it's different people, how are they managing the conversations with the different individuals within the organization? So it's about the coordination that's happening across the different um, go-to-market roles um, that matters. Uh, that's, an, that's an example of aligning the team. You see, particularly in customer roadblocks, you talk about the journey. Mm -hmm. Often what I find is that customer wants to be success stories, right? Where have you done this successfully? Hopefully, maybe someone from that industry, whatever, couple of customer references, things like that. Mm -hmm. Like interview references, not just you know something they see on the collateral. Mm -hmm. You see that? Has that come up at all in helping? Um, so the, the question was, do we see um, uh, do we see those who are in kind of either in the anticipating roadblocks or just in generally doing headway selling? Do we see them um, more often using case studies uh, that help the customer to understand the journey um, that they're going on? Um, uh, the so I can't say for sure, right? And so what I'm just thinking through is. Would I expect it, right? And what I will say is one thing that I'll I'll talk about in a, in a minute is the um, the the interact that when we interact with the buyers in ways that shuts down questions like that, we fail, right? And so seeing those types of case studies likely does matter. It's the nature of what those case studies look like, and it's probably more or less about like the the classic format is you know here's the customer's problem. 
here's how we solved it, here's how much money they got as a result of it, good, but like better if we can talk about in that case study the journey we went on with them, yeah. right? And the, the multi-year journey that we went on with them um, and how maybe that changed. We thought we were going to do this, we ended up doing this other thing, um, and that made everybody um, uh, super successful, right? Like that, that the nature of the case studies would likely look different. I'll just add, add to a couple of comments you made. Yeah. So in my view, we spend a lot of time doing this at our firm with, with Apex partners, a private equity firm based out of Columbia. We spend a lot of time making sure that our companies understand what their customer journey map looks like. You start there and you build that step by step to understand what does that evolution look like for them as they're going through their buying decision. I'll come back to the, the need to teach them how to buy. Once you sort of map all that out, we then spend a lot of time mapping our sales process to that and saying, does our sales process follow the buying journey that they need to take? It's worth investing a lot of time to sort of map that out and understand what does that look like on average, as you said, Brian? Mm -hmm. Because you may find 70% of the time you need to offer a case study at stage two in your sales process, yeah. right? But until you do that work and really understand that, you may miss that opportunity. But I, I would say start with building a really detailed customer journey map and then to, to some of the other sort of data that you were talking about, what that experience looks like for them. Make sure that as you're building that out, you look for the friction points that you're creating, your sales team's creating, your legal team's creating, your finance team's creating, your customer service and success team are creating, so that you can remove those friction points and create the CEBers in the room will appreciate the effortless customer experience, right? It's our responsibility to make that journey as easy and effortless as possible. So that's my two cents is I would invest a lot of time in building that out, understand the journey, understand the friction points, and then map my sales policy to that. Thank you, Richard. Um, so, okay, I want to talk a little bit about what we see on the buyer side, no. or sorry, on the on the uh, commercial team side. So, again, like I said, we've we've looked at about eight hundred plus uh, uh, commercial team members um, and evaluated them against some competent against a set of competencies and behaviors that we have uh, developed over time, and we conducted factor analysis on those behaviors. And factor analysis is basically, it's like, a, it's like a cluster analysis, right? You look for patterns of behaviors grouping together. So if somebody does things A, B, and C, they're highly likely to also do one, two, and three, right? And then there's another factor out there where they're doing M, N, and O, and also doing seven, eight, and nine. Um, and we, fa we, we formed these factors. Again, the factors aren't, aren't formed by us, they're formed just like naturally, right, by the behaviors that we see in the analysis that we do. And they grouped into four types of approaches um, that, uh, that the teams are taking um, in their interactions um, with, uh, with buyers. So what I want to say about these approaches, and I'll talk about them uh, and I'll preview, uh, two of them are doing really well and two of them are not. Um, and the other thing I'll say about them is it's kind of a majors and minors um, situation. So we're not saying that this is the only thing they do. It's their dominant approach. It's the dominant approach that they take to a sale. And you can almost think about that as when you're under pressure, right? Like you, you, you retreat to like your core nature. And so when they're under pressure, they're probably retreating even more to one of these um, four things. And we see this now as we've been testing it in our assessments as well. So the first one, narrowing. Um, narrowing is all about driving urgency through a smooth close and closing down blind alleys. So, so an individual who's taking a narrowing approach is um, trying to prevent any additional noise from coming into the system, prevent referral discussions, prevent bringing in the manager. And there's good reason to do this because the buying process is already taking so long, why would I introduce more noise just to extend that buying cycle? So they're doing everything that they can to get the, the buying team focused on making a decision. Provoking, the second one there, 
This is an insight. These, these are um, individuals who lead with insight. They're thinking about their stalled pipeline, and they're trying to find ways to restart it, um, uh, to reintroduce themselves, to restart the conversation. So they're sending insights. They're tailoring those insights. They're working with marketing on what the next campaign is. How can I get aligned with that? How can I um, target that to the right people so that I can restart a conversation with my stalled pipeline? That's provoking. The third one, translating. Translating, um, these are individuals who get it. Um, so you're starting to see some of the language come back here. Um, they understand what the buyer is trying to accomplish and they spend a lot of time with the buyers trying to figure out what that is. Um, they quantify their business cases and they do it in terms of, again, the context of the business um, that they're working with um, and looking at their long term. And they act as an extension of the team. And then finally, anticipating, again, a word that you've, that, that you've seen if you've been paying attention. They're oriented toward the future. They're the ones who are looking around blind alleys, uh, or sorry, looking at, around corners in terms of what's going to be happening with the, the customer uh, along their buying journey, um, removing those roadblocks. And a really interesting thing that you see those who do anticipating do is they spend a lot of time internally with their managers, with their peers, talking about the deal, um, trying to get advice on what's going on within this. So you see like lots of different uh, behaviors in terms of how they interact with, um, with the buying organization, as well as how they in interact internally. In terms of, you know, for example, provoking, spending more time with marketing, narrowing, trying to not talk to their managers as much as possible so they can just work the deal, um, et cetera. So I kind of gave away, gave away the goose a little bit with the, with the phrasing, but two of these sound a lot like headway selling, don't they? Translating and anticipating. And what's interesting, what I want to, what I want to point out to you all um, that uh, uh, I don't know if I should or, or not, um, this, this um, research on the commercial teams was a completely separate research initiative from the one on the buying teams. And um, uh, we weren't forcing anything, right? Like we, we were just kind of like, well, what's going on with buyers now? Um, and when we looked at these things together, we started to realize they're telling us the same thing. The buyers who are making bold purchase decisions are telling us about the behaviors that they're seeing from the teams that are show, showing themselves to be more successful. Um, in terms of the distribution, this is how they distribute in nature. So 35% of the, the commercial team members that we look at are using narrowing. 29% are using provoking. Um, and then about less than 40%, about 37% collectively using what we would see as headway selling approaches. Sorry, is this, this is go-to-market Yes, this is them telling us, this is them telling us what do they do, right, when they're, when they're interacting with the, uh, the buying organizations. Um, so a lot of focus on narrowing and provoking, which makes a lot of sense in the market that they're all operating in when they're just trying to get people to make a, Damn decision. Um, translating, anticipating, less focus. Um, guess what? Narrowing and provoking extend cycle time by a lot. The better you get at narrowing and provoking, the longer your deals take to close. That's what we're seeing from these uh, from these sellers. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Go back to this slide. Yeah. Is that also a function of who you're selling to? I know this is like sure. Yeah, yeah. The, the question is, does this vary? Is this a function of where, who they're selling to? Um, no. Uh, it, it, well, no with a caveat, right? If you think back to what I showed you earlier, yeah, about the size of the deal, right? And, and the complexity of the organization that they're selling into. If it's a really simple organization, not a lot of change, and, uh, and the deals are small, yeah, probably narrowing and provoking are gonna work um, better. Um, but, uh, um, but when we're above 25,000 and the organization is complex, this is what's doing it. So translating and anticipating get shorter. Translating not by much, but the, still they get shorter. And when we look at performance of the individual um, team members, what you're seeing here is the likelihood that they will level up. So if they're a C player, that they'll become a B player. So that's, you know, 
They're more likely to be hitting their quotas. They're more likely to be strong performers on the competencies that matter to us as an organization. Um, the likelihood that they are going to level up um, as an individual, as a professional, increases a lot more um, when they are taking translating and anticipating um, as their primary approach. It goes up as well for narrowing and provoking. And what we think is happening here is um, it's the difference between having an approach and not, right? Like you, there are plenty of sellers out there who just, they, have, they don't necessarily have any discipline. They don't have a plan for how they're going to go uh, about their accounts. If you've got some kind of a discipline and consistency in how you're approaching things, you're going to see some improvement in your performance. It's just going to take you a lot longer. When you apply, when you apply the headway selling approaches, um, it's going to be faster, um, and you're going to be faster to accelerate in your, in your career and your performance, and your individual team members are similarly going to be so. Sorry, I want to ask questions. Yeah. It's okay. No, please. Um, the leveling up, is that... Do you find that shocking, like 34%, 38%, maybe that's sort of a bias, but it's maybe more wishful thinking? Hmm. But they think they can get their sellers to do that, like the up level. Because it strikes me that translating and anticipating, that's a, that's a, a profile of that seller who would probably be like pretty confident, pretty seasoned, mm -hmm. and ability to do that. Mm -hmm. so that's not most of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the the comment is is the up leveling a you know is it a result of just your level of experience because these are harder things to do um, and so your newer um, professionals are less likely to be doing those types of things and then is it just kind of a rosy um, uh, picture of their likelihood of of doing that like are we just capturing more tenured professionals versus less tenured professionals for example it's it's possible. What I would say to that, though, is that what, there's a lot that we can do from a support perspective in order to get people to do more of the translating and anticipating. They are more difficult things, but if we know and we're clear on what are the types of behaviors and approaches that we want our professionals to be taking, um, then we have a better chance of giving them the tools that they need um, to take um, some of these more, um, these more advanced and maybe more difficult, more intensive um, approaches to the sale. So here's what we think is happening here, right? Like, when you think about narrowing and provoking and what they do, it's creating headwinds. It's creating friction for the buying team, right? The buying team is saying, I, can, you get me, can you get me a referral? I'd like to talk to some of your, some of your um, other customers. And the seller is saying no, right? Or the seller is trying to get, prevent that from happening because they're trying to drive urgency, right? They're, they're forcing their sales process on it, to Richard's comment, right? Without any understanding or, or consideration of the buying process that needs to be going on. Um, they're, they're forcing their own information onto the supplier. There's a really direct contrast with the headway selling approaches that are reducing friction, right? Narrowing is about closing down that, um, that process. Anticipating is about uh, eyes wide open. What does this process look like? What's coming and what do we need to do to fix that? Uh, or to, to address that. Provoking, similarly, is about, let me tell you all the things about us, right? Translating is, let me understand all the things about you, and what's going on with you and your organization, and how we can help you um, to advance along that journey. So there's a difference in the, uh, the approach, and we think about it as creating headwinds um, for that buying team, which is already facing a whole mess of problems, right, and, and difficulty, uh, and, and barriers to making decisions, Whereas the headway selling approach is reducing that friction, eliminating friction for that team, making it easier for them to make decisions. So two things to remember. Buying teams need help looking beyond their problems today. They need help um, uh, gaining confidence that they're going to be able to solve the problems that they know are coming and they can't quite put their fingers on and can't quite define. Um, but they know that they need a supplier who's going to be there to help them with that. So that's the first thing. And your team succeed um, by taking 
the translating and anticipating approaches towards their interactions um, with the buyers and the buying decision teams, helping them along that journey. So Vince had this comment. Um, it, was, it was in a different context, but he said about how you know, a CFO, business run by a CFO, gives you a spreadsheet and says, the spreadsheet says it, so it must be true. And I run the risk here as a researcher showing you charts, one bar is higher than the other. The data says it, so it must be true. Um, I've tried to give you an understanding of the logic and what's happening here beyond it. Um, but we, SBI, um, can help you to think about um, not just um, that this is true and it's, it's intellectually interesting and it's important, but how, uh, to what extent are we doing this now? How can we do it better? Um, and, and what are the things that we can put into place? How can we assess our teams on to what extent they're, they're taking the translating and anticipating approaches? Um, can, we, um, uh, can we adjust our, to Richard's point, our sales playbooks, our articulation of the, the, the sales process and the buying process, the buying journey, um, and re-articulate those? Um, can we think about the way we're targeting customers and the way we're understanding what their needs are um, and, and who are our best opportunities? Um, can we rethink those? That's all about, that's all how we get into the details on this uh, beyond what the big bar and the little bar says. Big bar and little bar is important. Um, it's what, you know, pays the bills for me. Um, but the impl implementation is, is what really pays the bills um, for all of us. Um, so uh, we're happy to uh, go deeper on any of this with you all. Any other uh, questions or clarifications? Rick. Awesome. Yeah, Richard. On your talent assessment work that you guys do, mm -hmm. you guys are clearly doing assessment on existing teams and understanding what their skill sets they are and what their capabilities are. Are you guys going further upstream and saying, hey, here are the skill sets you should test for, here's how you test for that recruiting process so that you feed the engine with the right capabilities? Yep. Do you do that as well? Yeah, for sure, because it, it, it can articulate you know, beyond translating and anticipating, what are the competencies that our highest performers, our A players, are, are exhibiting? And so that's what are the types of things that we should be looking for um, in our hiring profiles, and how can we translate that? Forgive the term, but how can we, how can we, how can we, uh, how can we put that into our assessments um, as we're evaluating uh, potential new hires, for sure. Yeah, it's a critical part of it.